open up in a series of interviews around the release of his new book a few years ago, Things That Matter. And we spoke for hours. It was his life in his words. And I asked him, what do you think about this project? And he said, I don't like it. I need to write my father's story before I pass on, because there's nobody who will remember the story except me now. It's the story of the 20th century. He was born in 1903, he died in 1987. By the end of his life, he spoke nine languages, not because he was a great scholar, but because he lived in a lot of places and not always moving willingly. And whenever he needed a word he didn't have in either French or English, he picked it out of Russian or Polish or German, it didn't matter. So no one understood what he was saying. But he had this sort of charming amalgam of all the cultures he lived in. And his story was an epic one because it starts in Eastern Europe, ends up in America with uh, France, Cuba, Brazil, uh, Belgium, everywhere in between. He would have preferred uh, that I follow in his way to be a religious Orthodox Jew. But he was completely open when he saw that I went a different way. He insisted when I was young that I study the scriptures and the commentaries and that I not be ignorant. He said, if you're ignorant, you'll never be able to choose wisely. But if you know, you'll choose and you'll choose and I will be happy and respect whatever you take. And that sense of openness reinforced my attachment to Judaism. Even when I gave up the practice of the religion, I had this revelation about uh, the broad-mindedness and the universality of Jewish culture. And it brought me back at a different place, not the kind of practicing Jew that my father was, but as somebody who deeply respects and wants to perpetuate Jewish culture. So that's where I ended up as a result of the broad-minded upbringing. And, and rather than abandon it, as many Orthodox Jews do when they're raised Orthodox and then rebel against it, um, that never happened to me. Well, I knew he wasn't a believer, and I am a believer. And, um, and I, you know, the God I worship, he would want Charles in his presence. Who wouldn't? When I became sort of politically conscious in my late teens, when I was in college, began to get involved in political thought, when I was studying political theory, I've been impressed by just the history around me in those days. Just look at, for example, in my 20s was the Cultural Revolution in China. And they set about to deliberately destroy 5,000 years of Chinese high culture. The arts, the sciences, everything leveled by the wrong politics. And then, of course, the worst example of all is the Holocaust. Uh, there was a thousand year old civilization of European Jews flourishing, uh, producing in the arts and the sciences and culture, and all of it is utterly wiped out in six years. Now that tells you that you better get the politics right, or all the lovely, wonderful things in life are extinguished. And that's sort of the reason I changed what I was doing, starting out as a doctor and decided I wanted to be involved in what ultimately is the most important of all endeavors. I had applied to medical school really to please my family, I, from a family of doctors. So I applied, I'd been accepted, and I deferred indefinitely. After that, I went to Oxford and I studied political theory, but I began to feel that I was sort of spinning out into a universe that didn't have anything to do with the real world. One night, a roommate sat on top of one of my armoires in a, in a yoga p position maybe two in the morning, he's around a strange bird. And he said, Krauthammer, can pigs think? This is an important element in the thesis he was writing. And I had an enjoyable conversation that lasted into the morning. But I began to think, you know, that may not be the most useful way to spend your life. And I thought, you know, why don't I go to medical school and have a very straightforward life where everything is clear and plain? That afternoon, I went down to the public phone in the dorm. This was a long time ago. We didn't have cell phones. I called the registrar at Harvard Medical School and said, uh, uh, I'd like to, um, to come in the coming class. And I remember her saying, well, one guy dropped out. We got a spot. If you're here on Monday, it's yours. So I grabbed a toothbrush. I didn't pack. I got on a plane and I left. Now, when I woke up in Boston <laughs> the next day, I thought to myself, oh my God, what have I done? 
there's an internet story out there that I dove into an empty pool. And I traced the source of it to Arthur Schlesinger. He wrote that in his diaries. He never met me, spoke to me, doesn't know anybody, anything about me. So, I mean, if that's a reflection of the accuracy of the histories he wrote, then he's a, a master of fiction. I see it like as if it happened in a film. It was the end of my first year of medical school. We're doing neurology. We're studying the spinal cord, of all things. My classmate and I decide to skip the morning session. Beautiful July day. We're gonna, and we play tennis instead. We get, and we're, we're now headed over to class for the second session. We're very sweaty. It's very hot, very beautiful day. So we drop in next door to the medical school to the children's inn. You know, those are the, the uh, hotels nearby for the parents of children. When my friend and I arrived at the pool, there were lots of people in it, swimming in it. We go for a swim, we take a few dives, and I hit my head on the bottom of the pool. The amazing thing is there was no cut on my head. It just hit at precisely the angle where all the force was transmitted to one spot, and that is the uh, cervical vertebra, which severed the spinal cord. I'd been studying neurology. I knew exactly what happened. I knew why I wasn't able to move and I knew what that meant. And I knew I was at the bottom of the pool, and I knew I wouldn't be able to swim. I was sure that was the end. And interestingly enough, for people who talk about the near-death experiences, there was no panic, there was no uh, great emotion. I didn't see a light, I didn't, my life did not flash before me. You sort of get to a place where you're ready, and, and then you're suddenly, brought back to the world. My friend, thinking I was fooling around, left me down there for a while because he thought I was playing. Then he pulls me out and there were two books on the side of the pool when they, they picked up my effects. One was The Anatomy of the Spinal Cord and the other one's Man's Fate by Andre Malraux. Quite a choice. I didn't know what was coming, but it fit very well. Thirty thousand pictures of him taken. You know how many show him in a wheelchair? Two. <laughs> the fact is that he lived in an age, forget about the prejudices, where that was considered a private matter, and for him, ignoring it or denying it or transcending it was the essence of how he treated it. And there's a great dignity in that. He never discussed it with his mother, who was the closest person to him. He lived a life of kind of fierce denial. I don't mean you deny the facts of it, but you deny its effect on you. You simply say, I'm gonna live the way I was gonna live otherwise, and he did. For the first mm, three months or so, I was so sick that it was hard to visit me because I had pneumonia hovering at the edge for quite a long time. Respirator, masks heavy doses of antibiotics. And at that point, I didn't have anybody come to see me, I think. When I started to come out of that, I resumed my classes. The professors would come in, uh, repeat their lectures, and project slides on the ceiling. Because I had asked the medical school to let me stay with my class. They'd wanted to give me a year off, and I knew once I got off the horse, I'd never ride it again. One of the cardiac residents hooked up a plexiglass plate above my head that he hung from the posters of the bed and the nurses would put a book on it face down. Now you don't want to call them every three minute and a half to turn the page so I put two books up at once so they'd only have to come half the time. But that's how I was able to study. Towards the end of the recovery, this is now 10 months in. Remember, I'm an inpatient in a teaching hospital. So one of the residents would come by at six o'clock at night. I'd put on a white coat and stethoscope, get in a wheelchair, and I would go around and do rounds. So I was able to do the clinical course at night between six and about midnight. And then I would turn into a pumpkin, go back to my bed and become a patient again for the rest of the night until 6 p.m. the next day when I'd be a doctor. This is a guy who was robust and healthy. It's not as if he was born with this problem. It happened to him, you know, when he was in, in, in med school. And somehow he summoned himself to finish med school and to enter that profession. I knew what the deal was from the first day, so I never had any illusions. 
And I would get infuriated by people who would give my cellmates, you know, the guys I shared the hospital rooms with, false hope. There was one guy in my room of four who said to me, I'm going to give a cure seven years, and then I'm going to kill myself. Now, I don't know what happened to him, but that sent a chill through my life hearing that. In those interviews, I was struck by this. As a young man, Charles is really conflicted about which way his life is going to go. He goes to Oxford to study philosophy, but determines it's too esoteric, too highbrow, and he wants more reality. So he goes to Harvard Medical School, but he really was straddling those two disciplines. And then look what he chooses in his medical specialty. I studied politics and philosophy before, and I had this feeling that this is too abstract, I should be doing something serious with my life, you know, a kind of real job in the real world with real facts, not hoity-toity ideas and terms that nobody understood. Enough of this airy-fairy stuff. Get real with life. So I decided to go to medical school, but I wanted to do something that I thought would be sophisticated and intellectual and in some ways abstract. So I was looking for something halfway between the reality of medicine and the elegance, if you like, of philosophy. So uh, psychiatry was the obvious thing. I was lucky because it was probably the easiest branch of medicine for me to do once I was hurt. But it worked out that I didn't have to change any plans. I'm pretty much anti-Freudian. The reason I chose the Mass General program is because it's very biological. They do drug therapy, they do hypnosis, they did behavior therapy, they did shock therapy. They did incredible stuff. But they made some concessions to psychotherapy. And there was a group therapy once a week. And I didn't go, but I was actually called into the chief's office after about seven weeks of non-appearance. And he said to me, why aren't, why aren't you going to therapy? And I said, sir, I came here to give therapy, not to receive it. And he said to me, you're in denial. <laughs> and I said, of course I'm in denial. Denial is the greatest of all defense mechanisms. I could be a professor of denial. I mean, I'm an expert. At, but I was going on and on. He wasn't very amused. And he said, look, you're either going to do this or he, I can't have you in the program. So having no real prospects, <laughs> I exceeded and I went to the next 21 weeks of sessions or whatever it was. But I didn't really say a word. So whatever people would notice that, they'd say, why aren't you talking? I said, because I'm in denial. Uh, I'm not a big uh, therapy guy. We live in a confessional age. People talk about their feelings, they have to. That's what we worship, the, the age of Oprah. There's this whole idea of catharsis that has to do with the psychiatry part. One of the reasons I left psychiatry is I'm not high on catharsis. I'm not high on feelings. You ask yourself, well, maybe I chose the wrong profession. <laughs> I did. That's why I left. This is News Headquarters. I'm Trace Gallagher. The Navy is making plans to build detention centers for thousands of immigrants. The tent cities would serve as temporary housing for about 25,000 people awaiting trial for entering the country illegally. A Navy memo describes the facilities as temporary and austere. It's expected to cost about $233 million. Housing locations include Navy bases in Alabama, Arizona, California, Texas, and possibly Arkansas. The military has also been asked to provide housing for nearly 20,000 immigrant children. New details tonight about Anthony Bourdain. An autopsy found no drugs or alcohol in his body. The cause of death remains suicide by hanging. The celebrity chef was working in France at the time. He was cremated in that country shortly after his death. On June 8th, Bourdain was 61. I'm Trace Gallagher. Now back to Charles Krauthammer. His words. Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a doctor himself, before becoming a writer, talked about the lessons that you learn as a doctor, discipline, confidence, and being able to be decisive. And all of that is indispensable. And the last thing I got from it is a very deep understanding of science and also appreciation of empirical evidence. He spent seven years, most of it in hospitals, in a sea of human suffering. 
And if you're some hotshot kid from Harvard, it beats the callowness out of you in the sense that you're the master of the world and it humbles you in many ways. It makes you appreciate human life. It makes everything you write about and talk about less abstract. Here I was approaching the last year of my residency and I thought, I don't really want to continue to do this. I liked what I did, I was okay at what I did, I did a little research, but my heart wasn't in it and I felt there was a world happening out there outside the hospital walls, but there was no way to get from here to there. And pure, sheer, blind, serendipitous luck. One of the professors at Harvard I'd, I'd written a few papers with on bipolar disease, out of the blue got appointed by Jimmy Carter head of the equivalent of the National Institutes of Mental Health. The second I heard about it, I went right to his office. I said, Jerry, I hear that you're going to Washington. He said, yes. I said, I also hear that if you go to Washington without a right-hand man, they're going to eat you alive. So he said, where'd you hear that? I said, well, I made it up, but I really think you need somebody. He said, okay, you got the job. And I came to Washington, and Jerry, my boss, my uh, professor, was the only person I knew in DC for a radius of 200 miles. But I thought, once I'm in Washington, isn't that where they do politics? One thing will lead to another. I had been a reader of the New Republic as, you know, sort of liberal magazine, very well written, interesting, and I thought, maybe I could do this. And then one day, they ran a classified ad. The New Republic seeks a managing editor apply here. We were overwhelmed with the response and most of them were lawyers and wanting to get out of the law and then there was this one psychiatrist who was Charles and we arranged for him to come to lunch. So I went down to see Mike and he interviewed me and he said can you show me a writing sample? I said unfortunately I can't I've never written anything. When I was a psychiatrist at Mass General and you discharge the patient you write a discharge summary. Now the first time I did a, a discharge summary it came out looking like it was written in Chinese. I had to rewrite the whole thing. But after one or two or three or four, I would dictate, this is 3,000 words, in one go, as long as I had it in my head where I was going with this. So I learned to dictate long things just from the practice I got at Mass General as a psychiatrist. So then when I began to write articles on other stuff, I was in that habit. So I wrote something, they liked it, that they published it, and I got lucky again. It was republished on the op-ed page of the Washington Post. It was the first time any article of the New Republic had been picked up by the Post. So I hit a double for first time. How many people have you heard of who become uh, giants of journalism uh, just by sending a piece to the new, a magazine like the New Republic? That's what Charles did. Then I went through another stage. I became a speechwriter for the Vice President of the United States, Walter Mondale. I joined them sometime in the spring of 1980. Talk about luck. I had met, to, again, sheer blind luck, once at a dinner, the chief speechwriter. And when we'd met a second time, we were talking about his job. He said, you know, and he mentioned that their third speechwriter had quit. And I thought, well, that might be interesting. I said, well, um, maybe I could apply. He said, uh, okay, so he gave me Jim Johnson. Jim Johnson, who was the chief of staff to Mondo, interviewed me, and of course, the first question is, can you show me a writing sample? So I had to go through the same thing. Sorry, I don't have any. You ever written a speech? No, anyway. So he said, I'll tell you what, Mondo's giving a speech next week. Write me a speech. I looked up political speeches and began reading them. So I get an idea of what political speeches look like. It struck me when I first came to Washington was the fact that all the monuments here, unlike the monuments in Europe, are monuments with words on them. So I decided I would make that the theme. And I wrote that, they liked it, they used it, they hired me. 1980, he worked for Walter Mondale, Democratic candidate for vice president. But this was long before the, the tribalization of American politics and the polarization that have the two parties facing one another across the barricades in mutual incomprehension. It was a much more gentle kind of partisanship then. And when we got totally crushed in the general election, I got a call from the New Republic and they said, we think you're unemployed now. Would you like to come work for us? 
There was a rope down the bottom of the well. I, I, I said yes, said yes right away and started. On the day Reagan was sworn in, that's the first day I started at the New Republic as a writer. I wrote one editorial that caused the largest number of canceled subscriptions in the history of the magazine. It was one that I bore with pride. So I ended up supporting just about every element of the Reagan foreign policy, the build-up, support for the Contras, strategic defenses, all the stuff that liberals opposed. And I wanted the magazine to support that. So I wrote the unsigned editorials, and boy, did we get reaction from our liberal readership. And we were getting letters you wouldn't believe. Oh, you know, what are you doing? You're a traitor. So I suggested that we should do something with all the letters coming in, that every week the editors should choose the worst letter and then cancel the writer's subscription. We would announce that they are unworthy of reading our magazine and no, you're not getting a refund. Apparently on the business side, this was not accepted as a very good idea, so it never passed. There were two people, converts to conservatism, who had this enormous influence on politics over the last half century. One was Ronald Reagan, the other was Charles Krauthammer. I was a great society liberal. I thought we ought to help the poor. We ought to give them all the money we can. And then you got uh, the evidence started of the poor end, documenting how the great society had hurt the people they were trying to help. And as a doctor, I'd been trained in empirical evidence. If the treatment is killing your patients, you stop the treatment. I think the most important element of it was what, what the big government was doing to civil society. Because the essence of a free society is the independence and the strength of the institutions that lie between the government and the individual. The church, the school, the family, the community. I wanted to see a strengthening of civil society and all the evidence was that these well-intentioned programs were destroying the, the intermediate institutions or weakening them. So that sort of undermines the entire American experiment. Oh gosh, I started reading Charles when I was in high school um, in the Washington Post probably when I was 15, I'm now 49, so a long time. I was a New Republic reader, I was conservative, but the New Republic had this kind of eclectic mix of writers and a lot of intellectual foment, and um, it was just a vibrant magazine. I didn't always agree with Charles, but I appreciated his intellectual honesty and the clarity of his thinking, and he was willing to take an argument to its logical conclusion and had the horsepower to do that. I discovered at the very beginning, you write anything, a column, an essay, if you get the structure wrong, you'll never get it right. You'll spend hours whacking your way through the weeds with a machete, and you won't be able to escape the marsh. I take 10 minutes to, to write out an outline, and then I use a 1972 cassette tape recorder that I talk into, and I'm done. And then my assistant transcribes it. And then I spend the next four or five hours editing the text. I go through it 15 times from beginning to end, cleaning, sanding, polishing, just like a clay ornament. And then I get it right, then I sleep on it. That's the best part. Then I wake up in the morning, spend another hour, because by then, overnight, I discovered 15 egregious errors or mis not misstatements, but wrong way to put things, and I fix those. But that's uh, just my, I mean, other people write easily. I find it very hard. I have a horror of the blank page, but once I'm editing, it's like a puzzle, and I like doing puzzles. Charles won the Pulitzer Prize for commentary in 1987, and this was a huge moment for him, but also for his father, who never really truly understood why Charles left a career in medicine for a job in journalism. The last time I saw my father, he had a cancer and he was very sick. This was about six years after I left medicine. And I had just received the Pulitzer in the afternoon in this ceremony. And then I went to the hospital where he was. And when I came in, I said, Dad, I have something I want to give you. And I gave him the medal. And he beamed and he showed it to all the nurses. So the last time I saw him was a time when this whole circle was closed and he could feel that the choice had been redeemed in some way. But it was a very comforting thing to remember about the last time you see your parent. Charles talked to me a lot about his dad. 
a lot of different conversations. But getting him to talk about his wife, Robin, and his son, Daniel, that was more of a struggle. His relationship with Robin, I mean, it is a true love story. They meet in Oxford. She's from Australia, a brilliant lawyer. Uh, he then goes to the States, to Harvard Medical School, and she comes after his accident. Their son, Daniel, is a terrific young man, just amazing person. Uh, getting Charles to talk about either of them was tough. I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. When Dan was born, I wrote a column about his birth. And it was a good column, and it was nice. And, and then when he was one, I wrote one on his first birthday. And then I realized I'm never going to do this again. This is using him. This is going to be his vision of himself through my eyes. And I simply won't do it. I never wanted to use personal relationships as material. When I first met him, and I, and I said, I didn't know. And I said, Charles, this is embarrassing. Let's bring in our special expanded panel again. My mother would watch it even if I wasn't on it. That's high praise. And the beautiful thing is, because the news is breaking all the time, we get to be out there early. And you want to be out there early to give an opinion because it can have an extra nudge if it's early. Why, it's Brit Hume, as I live and breathe. I don't remember the exact details, but they were, he was coming on the air occasionally. And then we began to have him on occasionally on Special Report, which I was then anchoring. And he was terrific. You know, there was just nobody like him. Well, those euphemisms are false. This is not a forest fire that erupted because of lightning. This was a deliberate campaign, a war, in fact. So Charles became a regular, and I so cherished the time when he would come in. 30 back. We'd bring him in early because of the set we had then. It was a little awkward to get his wheelchair in place. So for a couple of segments before the rest of the panel came in, he was there with me as I read the news or did whatever I did, and then we would chat during the commercials. I love chatting with Charles during the commercial. I mean, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's one of a kind, and I just like being around him. I always imagined that I'm speaking to my son. She was a terrible case. She was the worst, I mean, the worst imaginable. She had all the advantages. You don't want to talk in highfalutin, ridiculous abstractions, wars that nobody understands. But I just try to make things plain, clear. I mean, I always imagine I'm uh, talking to an audience that wants to learn and that will listen. The one thing I, I, I try to do when I want to persuade someone is I never start with my assumptions. Because if I do, we're not going to get anywhere. You have to figure out where the other person believes in at root. And then you try to draw a line from what they believe in to what I believe in by showing them a logical sequence. But you got to lead them along, and you have to have it in your head from the beginning, or you'll never get there. It's not a question of sparing people offense. It's a question of when you have a public monument, you're making a public statement. I actually smile when I think about the last time I was with Charles because it was one of our iconic kind of dust-ups on Special Report. What Trump did today was a moral disgrace. They got pretty testy. I resent that you just said it was a cop-out what I said on this set. You know, he was frustrating to me, and I'm sure I was really frustrating to him, but we understood at the end it was a really good segment. I can, doesn't bother me. On paper, Looking at him, he'd say, this is not a man designed for television. This is not a potential TV star. In fact, he became a huge star, even I would almost say a mega star on this channel. And it was the sheer force of his intellect and the power of his thinking. If he gets up there and calls for a pause or something that the country he doesn't want to do, he will be a laughing stock. I'd say half the people I meet are absolutely surprised to see me in a wheelchair. And one of the more amusing of those incidents happened about Oh, about eight, nine years ago, I was sitting in Madison Square Garden in the Fox Box. I think it was a convention. Sean Hannity stands up and walks up the stairs. He looks at me and he goes, what happened? Now, what I really should have done, I should have done this. Oh my God, you're right. I have no idea. <laughs> I interviewed him so many times. For me, Charles, it's, uh, it's very simple. I never noticed. And when I first met him, and I, and I said, I didn't know. And I said, Charles, this is embarrassing. What are you talking about? That's what I'm looking for. And he goes, you're not the only one. A lot of people 
feel have not noticed it either. But it just told me that even somebody I've been on the air with wouldn't know. And, and a lot of people come up to me at restaurants and have the same question, like, what happened? I'm tempted to say, you know, I sprained my ankle last week, <laughs> but it was a real bad sprain, so I got this elaborate wheelchair. I'm not averse to the spotlight. I'm not gonna pretend somebody who's on television every night doesn't enjoy it. I, I've never wanted to make myself the focus of my career. One of the things I aspire to in all of my columns is I try never to use the word I. A lot of columnists write the word I all the time, and to me, every time you use it, it's a failure. But the point of what I do is I'm, I left medicine to do this, to put ideas in the right order and hopefully to convince people of certain things that I believe in very passionately. But when it comes to interior life, and of course, it has to do with the fact that I'm in a wheelchair, it's the first thing people see and they're, they're curious about. And I know it's inevitable um, that people are gonna wanna talk about my unusual history. But I'd rather let the words speak for themselves. That's why, that's why I wrote the book. Those are the words I've written. And that's why I wrote the autobiographical introduction, which speaks to what I think is the essential part of my life, which is my career and my thoughts and my writings. Charles is in New York promoting his new book, Things That Matter. And there you take a look at it. It's on the shelves now. The book's success was astonishing. It was surprising to Charles and to his publisher, I'm sure because collections of columns, I can speak from experience, don't usually sell like that. But it was a testimony to the hold that Charles had on a large public that had gotten to know him, frankly, on Fox News. Charles, why did you write this book? Gambling debts. <laughs> I, put, I put my money on the Cubs, Obamacare, and the Ed Show. <laughs> I guess the oddest book review actually came from President Trump, who actually tweeted, quote, on sale today, things that matter in paperback with a new section on the Obama years. Book sucks. <laughs> Charles, Charles loved that. He literally said he wanted to put that quote on the cover. Uh, wow, Krauthammer and Trump, that really was something. I must say, of course, the high point was when he mentioned me, I thought I was gonna be the <laughs> surprise new <laughs> national security advisor, so I was somewhat I think it's still disappointed. <laughs> well, I'll miss you, Brett. <laughs> you know, to certain political ideologies or social changes, but you're missing the obvious. There's always a person. Everyone sees it in their own personal lives. Yes, there are the forces that influence your personal life, but there's a, usually a person who influenced you in a way that all the underlying forces cannot account for. American history is populated by the figures without whom the arc of our history would be completely different. Washington, Lincoln, FDR, Reagan, they all stand out. And I think that's, that's overlooked. Here's where I get close to almost religiosity. There's a kind of providential nature to American history. When we needed a Lincoln, we got a Lincoln. That saved the Republic. In the, in the 20th century, when we needed an FDR, and we got an FDR, and in the second half, we needed a Reagan, we got a Reagan. We've missed him so much over these past uh, months uh, here at Fox, and there's no one that really replaces him. There's, there's, it's been a void. Uh, because of his knowledge of history, his knowledge of science, uh, his, his knowledge of, of Washington, obviously. But the intersection of, of science, culture, politics, history, uh, that's a pretty big sweep. Uh, not a lot of people have that. It's my job to say what I think is true. It's my job to say what I think will work. It's my job to call a folly a folly. Whether it straightens them out, I don't know. I don't know whether it's going to have an effect on them, but there's no other way for an honest critic to be, other than to be honest and to be critical. Whether it's gonna have the effect, I don't know. There's a great line by Tom Stoppard who once said about his own life as a writer and what he tried to do, he said, you know, you spend your life writing and every once in a while, you put, word, you, you put words together all your life and every once in a while, you get them in the right order and you give the world a nudge. 
So I just hope I get the Lord's in the right order every once in a while and give the world a nudge. That's the most I can hope for, but it's what I exist to do, really. Charles and I used to talk about whether there is a lasting impact of journalism. Uh, we occasionally wondered how long it would take after we left the scene before we were forgotten. And our consensus was that it ranged anywhere from a nanosecond to six months. Uh, I think with regard to Charles, that's way too pessimistic. Henry Adams once said, a teacher has a kind of immortality because he or she never knows when his or her in 